All right, look at your notes. We're going to cover today the topic of perception. Before I do, see if you have any questions about sensation. We ended by looking at subliminal messages. We ended by looking at some, um, all of the interactions between the senses. And here's one very important thing related to vision I mentioned before. You do not need to know the anatomy or memorize the anatomy of the eye and the ear. Vision, hearing, very complex. For our purposes in this class, please read that section. Look it over, but um, the only thing I'll talk about is the centrality, which we've already done, of, the, of vision. And in that regard, um, you don't have to write this down, but whenever we talk about vision, there's a strong connection uh, with the area of thinking and the use of visual metaphors. So you can think of and see some of these examples that thinking and visual met metaphors are used almost interchangeably. People have insight or, or something that you might illuminate something or you might shed light on something. These are all things that we think about or talk about when it comes to thinking like enlighten or reflect or clarity. And then we use phrases like seeing is believing. Um, let me, you know, let me see, or I see, or it's good to see you. And all of these things show this very, very powerful predominance that we have with a sense of vision. For our purposes, and you can see here, by the way, when students were asked in one sur survey, which one of the senses you'd least like to lose, how many would least like to lose sight? Just raise your hands if of all the senses out there, and it's about right, you know, here's about 75% we usually find. Um, there are ways in which this sense is fairly dominant and shows up in a lot of these um, areas related to things like um, competition between the auditory and the visual. The visual oftentimes wins. Or uh, there are ways in which we begin to speak this language of visual. So look at, for our purposes, the section on feature detectors and the section on processing visual information. And um, that should about cover it. So I'm gonna let you read that in the textbook. What I'd like to do is take that next step and move into the area of perception. So we're gonna do that today, is spend our time looking at how do we make sense of our world and develop what we call these interpretations of these visual stimuli or auditory coming in and then make what we call a perception. So that's what we're going to do today. We're gonna to spend most of the day on perception. In fact, at the end of today, we might even get to a point where we're gonna talk about a phenomenon of not only perceptual adaptation, but uh, one that's even further afield, and that's something called extrasensory perception. So we'll do that by looking at this just a beginning of this process as visual, auditory, or other external stimuli strike us. When we organize and interpret these stimuli into something meaningful, when we take these senses and we organize them into something meaningful, we call that perception. It's exceedingly fast. So something we talked about that's effortless and automatic, something we do without even conscious awareness, and we do it very quickly. But this process can be slowed down slightly, especially when there are problems or in some things like visual illusions. So in this thing of perception, here's one thing we can look at. It's a picture of, this is called Frazier's spiral. How many can see the spiral in this image? You see what I mean, the spiral. It's called Frazier's spiral, it's pretty straightforward. The only difference or the only interesting thing is this isn't a spiral, Whoa. okay? The reason it's not a spiral is it's because it's a bunch of concentric circles. And the reason it's concentric circles is if you took and put kind of a circle like that, they're just circles. Now, perception is this. Your brain takes these, this sense, uh, this stimuli, this, these images, and turns it into a spiral, okay? Now, if you stare at this long enough, there's another interesting phenomenon. If you just look at the red, for, in fact, stare at one of the red lines, maybe the middle one, 
Just stare at a spot, and when it turns off, you can actually see an after image. It looks blue. Watch. I'll turn it off. You see how it lit up kind of a blue green? Anybody not see that? If you stare at the red long enough, you'll get what's called an after image. Now, lots of these little features about vision are important, but this one in, indeed it, it really points to this kind of almost way in which our brains organize and interpret something that's not there. So, for perceptual psychologists and those involved in this field, there's a, some central questions. When does our ability to organize and interpret our sensations develop? Is it something we're born with? Do we have this ability, for example, from birth, which would be a nativistic approach, which would say that we are born with the ability to organize our world into something meaningful. Now the question comes into play for some who say there are, there's evidence that points to the fact that some of our perceptions we have to learn or we get from uh, an empirical or a nurturing approach. And this is the whole idea of is it uh, nature or is it nurture when it comes to organizing these sensations into something meaningful. Anybody think of any examples in which this question comes into play? And I'll, I'll give you one. We find evidence that this question is central when it comes to individuals, for example, that have regained sight or their vision after a long period of time of not having it. So here's one example. This is a person who um, was blind from um, birth. Actually, he was blind shortly after birth. He probably had vision for the first eight to nine months of his life. Then he lost it. He's now 40-some years old, and he has a surgery which restores his vision, at least partially. And now the question is this, how will he see the world? If somebody's been blind, will it make sense? Will they, the things that they've been envisioning in their brains, seeing, will it now be clear to this person? Or will it be a confusing, kind of not so clear world that they see? So here was a test case. This person was restored, uh, their sight was restored, and then he was asked to draw a bus. Okay? He's now had his sight for a couple of months. He draws this bus, and this is what he drew. It's a picture like this. Okay? Nothing odd. Um, you, you know, he's, he certainly, when he was um, unable to uh, see, he would rode a bus, he had touched it, he had spent time near a bus stop, so you can see there's stairs in there, tires. But one thing that is clearly missing is what? Yeah, it's the front end. Now his response is this, in this front end, he claims this. He claims that when he was without sight, he had touched almost all of a bus. He touched the tires and the steering wheel and the stairs that went up to the double-decker. He can now see the advertisements there and even the sign for bus stop and felt that in the bench, but he says he'd never touched the front of a bus. So when he's asked to draw it, it's left out, but if you were to ask him, is this bus complete, he would say, yep, yeah, that's a full bus right there. That's what he sees. And so he's unable to even to write in that front part, in, in part because the idea is he may not have touched the front end of this bus, of this bus much when he was when he was, you know, without sight, and so it never, like, set into his brain. And so now that he does have sight, it's like he doesn't see that. That's interesting. Is it possible, then, that there is this piece up here that will never be filled in for him because when he was touching, it, he never was able to experience that? Well, are there any examples that you can think? We have some written examples from 2,000 years ago when people received sight and were healed. And how about in Jesus' ministry? Somebody was blind, he touches their eyes, they now go about and they're healed. And the question is, do they see everything normal? And in a lot of these cases, in fact, most of them, the people said, yeah, I can now see. And it's in a, there's, a, there's a great story, of course, of the man that was healed and all of the Pharisees thought, 
that's an amazing thing. They, they weren't obviously impressed as much as they were concerned that Jesus violated some of these rules uh, that should be followed. But the, the guy that, whose sight was you know, restored said, I, I, I can just tell you this. I don't know who he is, but before, where I, was, before I was blind, now I see. So it was clear that his sight came back. Can you think of another example of a healing in the Bible that Jesus did of a person who didn't see clearly right away? Remember the story of the guy and he said Jesus spat on the ground and made mud and put it on the guy's eye and he opened up. What did the guy see? How did he describe what he saw next? He said, he said, men looking like trees walking around. That, what image comes to mind for us? Almost like an unclear, like an out of focus thing, yes? So it's like he did it again. Rubbed his eyes, and the person said, now I see. There's some possible, and again, this is highly speculative, but it was almost as if the first time healed his senses, his vision came back, but he needed another one to heal his what? Maybe even his perceptions. The sense that the brain now takes and operates at a much higher level, the sense is coming in, but now this more broad sense of that's a human, and that's what this means. See, we take this for granted because our brains work this way from the very beginning, so we rarely, unless there's some sort of brain trauma, ever experience a separation between a sensation and a perception. I mentioned in here the uh, Oliver Sacks story, the person who helped find um, that there were people out there that were suffering, for example, from um, some sort of brain injury, oftentimes a stroke, that rendered them unable to perceive something that, the difference between an animated object and an inanimate object. And he wrote a book called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for His Hat when he tried to put her head on him as his hat. Okay. Well, there was a perceptual problem that's occurring. We looked at some of these circuits that help us. So the question is this. All of these individual differences in perception that come about are usually for normal vision, normal hearing, and, and uh, individuals with senses that work. We don't recognize these. We don't, they just kind of happen very quickly. Our perceptions are very quick. There are, however, ways in which we each differ individually in our perceptions based upon our backgrounds and our environments. Can you think of some individual differences, how you might sometimes encounter the exact same stimuli as somebody else, and yet you come up with a different perception? Can you think of any examples that might happen? If you've had a traumatic experience. Yeah, maybe there's a traumatic experience in life where there might just be a simple backfiring of a car and you dive down because you're afraid it was a gunshot. That same stimuli strikes us very differently. There are some individual differences related to things like our gender. We hear and interpret things differently. There are age differences related to some of our perceptions and some findings that show um, how old we are influences our perceptions. And also some differences, of course, related to culture. What we see and hear may be very different. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody? You walk away, two people walk away, and you both talk about that third person you were visiting with, and you had different experiences of what they said and how they said it and what the other person was like or what they might have meant. All of these are examples. Let me just show you some examples of gender differences. Um, here would be some things. Ready? Let me, let's just have a guy try this. Some, uh, guy, let me have a, a guy, okay? We'll do this, and then we'll try you as well. Tell me what um, you see in the top, top image. A comb? A comb? Um, Tell me what you see in the next image. An eye. An eye and another guy, the bottom image. And another, one more guy, real quick. What do you see? A monkey. So a comb, an eye, and a monkey. All right, let's try uh, three females real quick. Yeah, top one. Teeth. Uh, the middle one, let me see. Okay, yeah. A donut. <laughs> and the bottom image, a cup. Well, this didn't work as well as it normally does, um, and that's okay. Males tend to see a brush or a centipede or a comb. Females tend to, however, see combs or teeth. <laughs> So I think we went just maybe the opposite. These are very slight differences that don't always work in a class 
like this. The second one, we said you saw, what the guy see? An eye, and she saw a donut. Males tend to see a target, females a dinner plate. That's kind of close. That's not far off. Really, and, and just let me clarify, this is not a gender test, all right? This is just a simple perceptual test that sometimes has an influence. And the bottom one, the guy saw a monkey, and she saw a a cup. Ah. Ah, females tend to see cups, men tend to see monkeys. Or heads. How do you see the cup? Okay, by the way, as you're looking at this, these are very slight differences. You can be influenced by lots of different things. These are just simple ways of looking at gender differences. By the way, there are very detailed and complex ways we can kind of start teasing these out, but the differences aren't all that great in this area. There are some age ones. Age, for example, tell me what you see in this image. How many of you all see an old woman? How many see an old woman? How many see a young woman? Okay, 90% 90 of you raised your hand with the young woman, maybe 10% with the old woman. Anybody not see, how many do, still do not see the old woman? About half of you. All right, let me just show you. Here would be. This is the old woman right here. How many still don't see the old woman? All right. Here, I'll, put, I'll tell you what I'll do. Shh, hold on. Shh. I'll put glasses on her. That's one glass, and here would be her nose, and this gla these glasses, she'd be looking at you from the side. She'd be smoking a cigarette. Here would be the smoke. This would be her nose, her nostril right there. Maybe an ear right here. Anybody not see the old woman? I'm sorry if you can't see. This is her chin. Right here. She's looking over here at this thing. She's staring at this. Okay. All right, take out your clickers and we'll try a perceptual test real fast. Perceptual test. Same thing. This one is part of it. Some of your clickers may be on or off, I don't know. If you have to turn it back on, great, but here we go. It's the same kind of just picturing, see if you can see something real quickly, and um, all right, first picture, and this one will come back up, so now you should just mark that you see it or don't. I answer it this way, you did, if you didn't see the old woman for a little while, then answer no, even though maybe now you see it. So first question on the clicker, um, well, it starts right here. And you only have about 15, maybe 10 seconds. What animal is pictured below? Guess if you don't know, or just put D, I don't see an animal. A, you see a fox. B, you see a snake. C, you see a cow. Or D, you see no animal at this point. Five more seconds. You gotta vote real fast. All right. 137 of you see no animal, 20 see a fox, 11 a snake, and 200 see a cow. All right, next question. This was just already something we've done. You see the old girl. Put, if you see them both now, you can put C, but if you were originally, um, yeah, answer however you want on this one. I don't care. We've already done this one, so I'll just skip to the next one. If no one sees any, oh, hey, put, put what you have. Let's see what it is. Okay, some of you see the old woman, some of you still don't see either. All right, next question. Uh, does the, whoa, let me see, I went too far. Yep, here we go, ready? Does this picture at all appear to move to you if you stare at it long enough? Put just A, yes. It's moving, or you can see movement, or be not. And I'm going to show you a larger version of this in just a second. Um, this process of seeing movement in something uh, will, will explain a little bit uh, one of the dynamics. I just want to check it out and see how many do see it at all. And 
maybe a third of you do see it, and we'll show you a larger image next time. How many, uh, if you see an animal in this picture, put yes. If you do not, in five seconds, put B, no. So if you don't see it right away, go ahead and put B. And let's see how many in this one, by the way. Half and half exactly. Half of you see a picture, half of you do not. I'll show you that picture in just a minute. Which, which pilot would you rather have land your airplane? This is from Monsters, Inc., Mike, Sully, or you have no preference. Why is this even a question? The answer is what? Would you want somebody with one eye flying your airplane? How many would say the an Mike has one eye if you don't know that? Not because you like his personality. It's about vision and eyes. Would you be, how many, I just got, how many would be worried about if you had a pilot with only sight out of one eye? How many say that would worry you? Well, then you would probably want to have Sully drive or fly your airplane. All right, by the way, the answer, uh, no preference, 47 of you, uh, a good majority said Sully, and only 90 of you, 92 of you said you would let Mike fly your airplane. But he no. This is tapping into something that's very important, which is, well, air safety, but it's also tapping into something called depth perception. Let me ask you this, somebody with one eye, do they have depth perception? Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> what is depth perception? Well, I'll tell you what, we'll save it. I'll share with, tell you what that is a little bit. Let's try the next one. Are the lines of the square, do you see them as straight or bowed? The lines of, these square, of this square, straight or bowed? The answer, by the way, we'll talk a little bit about visual illusions, and in this case, about half and half see it. And we'll try one more. I th actually, we'll try two more. A, um, you'll see this arch called, starting with arch A, which is the continuation of arch A, and that is, uh, is it this, B, does it continue A or does C? Or neither. Small, but you can try and kind of make it out. Is it hard to see back there? A little bit? All right, if you don't know, if you still neither. And the answer, by the way, is B is the continuation. About a third of you put that, third put C, and some put neither. B, if you follow it, it goes like this. If you watch up here, I can draw this out in just a minute. In fact, I'll show you a bigger image, but I just wanted to um, see where, where it is real quickly and get a gauge. And then the last question, is there such a thing as ESP? A, you say yes, I believe that some people have what's called extrasensory abilities, or B, you do not believe that some people would have extrasensory or ESP abilities. We are going to uh, look at uh, an example of that. If not at the end of today, then first thing on Wednesday uh, with ESP. And looks like about 170, 173 believe that there are some people with this ability, and about 216 say there's not. Um, many more have maybe uncertainties. So what I want to do is cover some of this, what's called perceptual organization. Are there ways in which we begin to organize our perceptions? Let's start with this. What's a gestalt? A gestalt in this topic of perception is when we take an, take a, um, and organize our world into something that's a pattern or a whole, or a, the, the word gestalt would be a whole, a configuration. And in this, we're very good at filling in gaps, for example, or making something that's not completely clear, complete, uh, making it whole. And we call that this process of something called the gestalt. Some of the early psychologists would have been gestalt psychologists uh, who studied this area of perception. The way it works is something like we looked at this Necker cube before. 
This Necker cube is not complete. That is, there's gaps in it. There's, there's not even a full white line that goes right here or a black line, but we're able to feel it in. As we feel this in, we're able to come up with a hole. Okay? So given a cluster then of sensations, if we give you a cluster of sensations, you're able to organize these into a gestalt, into a whole. In this regard, we're very good at this. It's not something you had to have been taught. It seems as if we can, because rarely do we see, for example, the hole without some break in it. We might see a person, but only part of them and still be able to identify that as a human even though you only get a bit or pieces of it. When you watch good graphics um, that are parts of movies, um, the best illustrators and those who do computer graphics know that you can, you're very good at taking these clusters and even if it's a computer generated form, we're good at knowing what makes it human. We can take six lights, maybe a few more, uh, at least three on your arm, three on your leg, uh, maybe one on your hip and on your head, and we could turn all lights off except for these and have you walk across, and it's just a series of about maybe even eight to ten lights that you see. But you can pick out these eight to ten lights as something that's human, something that a person is walking uh, or a person is standing there, and it's these lights that are just simply pieces that we can organize into a cluster. This is a picture of what? How many see the cow? How many do not see the cow? And the cow, the cow is looking out at the screen at you. All right, and he's looking out. We'll put, we'll put glasses on the cow. and a ring on his nose. Okay, there's your cow. Got it? In this process, we see things sometimes very quickly. What do you see here? How many see a seal? How many see the mule? All right, it's both, right? Given these different clusters, we can see either a seal or a mule. Here's another one. How many, did, how many did not see the animal in this? What is it a picture of? Can everybody see the dog, the Dalmatian dog? All right. Anybody still not see it? <laughs> the dog is facing away from you if you want. It's sniffing something down here. That's his ear right here. His head is right here. Does that help? It's his tail. Okay, maybe not. Some of you get it. How about this? What is it? Yeah, it's the world upside down. Right? All right, or maybe just viewed from a different angle. Now, in this regard, we also began to use certain principles to help us organize and divide up reality. A gestalt is taking something that's not a complete and bringing it together, this cluster, into a meaningful whole. There are also other principles such as figure ground. Figure ground is this process where we separate out the figure from the ground. Right now, today, this lecture, what should be the figure? Me, I ought to be the figure. All the distractions around you should be the ground. So we very quickly make these kind of switches back and forth. Sometimes the figure can fade into the ground and vice versa. This would be an example. Um, if you've seen these vases before, you can see the black vases. How many can also see the white faces? Can you see them? Okay, the faces in white. Here's the guy with his eyeball looking sideways. Here's his nose. Now can you all see the faces? Each one of them, the white are faces facing each other, and the black are faces. (laughs) 
Yeah. Real quickly, there are some cases in which there are some visual problems, even some perceptual problems, involve the inability to focus on a figure accurately. In fact, that becomes somewhat reversed. And um, it can be very difficult. Anybody not, by the way, see the faces? All right, you get it? This would be one of the best um, examples of using figure ground and trying to hide things is when we talk about things in the military like camouflage. Camouflage, now this you can see um, very clearly, but when ultimately when you design these aircraft, for example, with stealth technology, the goal is to have them become part of the ground, to have them hidden. So if somebody is either visually trying to track this plane or on radar, the goal would be to get it to be hidden, covered. Or visual images can change figure ground. This is an example of love and hate. Can you all see the words love and hate? All right, anybody not see words love and hate? These are all cool things. This is one, this is by an artist named John Langdon. It's called Us. Can you see me and you there? All right. You and me, this is just playing with figure ground. Anybody not see me or you? <laughs> I keep looking. Me is in brown. You is in the inside. Okay, it's called us. This is, these are called, by, John Langdon does a lot. He, he, this is optical illusion. Can you see the word optical and the word illusion? All right. In a series of images like this, you could present and alter your, whatever becomes your figure or ground, and these are all parts of what we call organizational principles um, that help us with perception. By the way, the reason is, is because, uh, you don't have to write this down in the yellow, but illusions kind of bewilder us a little bit because there's this implicit trust that we have, and that trust is that our senses are telling us what's going on with physical reality. So sometimes we maybe should not be as trusting of what our senses tell us, and that's when these optical illusions come into play. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, magic eyes, they're not as popular anymore, but um, how many of you all have seen like the photos or the posters that if you stare at it long enough, eventually another image comes into being. Yeah, they used to be called, yeah, you have to almost look at them with what appears like being cross-eyed. You look at it as if it had depth to it. And when you're able to do that, you're able to pull out this other image. Um, and it, it really takes advantage of, of, of our, you know, this retinal disparity and two different images coming to our brains through, you know, this distance between our eyes right here and then merging them together. It's, um, I'll show you a picture of one of those in just a second. Um, figure ground is just one. There's other principles we use when we organize our sensations. One is something called perceptual organizational grouping. And grouping is just a variety of different things that we do very quickly to tell us something belongs together, for example, or is distinct. So you use grouping, grouping principles to say, well, all of these students in here would be, this is a group, and we can do it very quickly. Somebody walking on the outside, it's just simple because of why you're, so oh, here be an example. These three lines or six lines, sorry, we would say group together. We tend to see these as groups of two, 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 and two. And we group them because they're slightly closer to each other. Or this one, we tend to see these as columns. This is a column of triangles and a column of circles and a column of triangles because we tend to put like things or similar things together. We could see this enclosed very quickly and easily as a, a shell, let's say. Um, and this we tend to see as a straight line and a wavy line. Though it's just as easy, these are all half circles. So you could see these as half circles like that, if you want, instead. But we tend to put it together as a straight line and a wiggly line. Does that make sense? These are all grouping principles. You can see these in the book. It goes through and lists some of the different ways in which this happens and that we can find it. Those are just grouping principles. Now, depth perception. 
why is it okay for Mike to fly the airplane or somebody with one eye could, well our fear is maybe they don't have depth perception and I said the answer is people with one eye or vision out of only one eye do have depth perception. What do they use for depth perception? You use it as well with two eyes. They use certain kinds of things. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, they use something called monocular cues that tell us things like how far away something is. Because, by the way, your depth perception is most accurate within a pretty short area. And that is because after I look out far enough away, the image in my right eye is receiving about the same image as my left eye. And the only reason I know something is far and distant is because of these monocular cues. Something like this. Um, I use like, for example, this can seems farther away because of the cues that we have. These bricks are getting smaller, and as these bricks get smaller, we think they're further away. So you can even use this in some ways. Remember, it's retinal disparity is what I'm talking about, right? Retinal disparity, the difference that your brain, the image that your brain receives, from this eye versus this eye allows us to reach out and grab something because of that depth perception. Now somebody with one eye would not have depth perception of small or of items that are very close to them. And so they would just have this one view which is there's a variety of monocular cues they could use to reach out and grab something that somebody with two eyes or vision out of both eyes would be able to have and that is this kind of ability to perceive depth and they would use cues like this. This ball and this ball are the same size. Does this one look bigger? It looks bigger because we use this cue that says it's further back, it's much bigger. If you were to roll it forward, it would dwarf this ball, but in reality, they are the same size, okay? But our brains say, oh, now this one's further back, therefore it's bigger if you roll it forward, but the same image shows up on both. So depth perception uses something called these different monocular and binocular, binocular cues to help us know depth. There are cool things like perceptual constancies. These constancies come into play when some, some things strike us this way, like this door is very much for us a rectangle, yet when you open the door, this is no longer a rectangle shape, but a trapezoid. But our brains don't think that this is just changed into a trapezoid. There's this thing called a constancy. Just because something changes, we don't think that it changed, we think ah, part of the environment changed. And this is called a perceptual constancy, which leads and can lead to some conflicts. Here's an example of a perceptual conflict. This would be a, an image that you can produce in two dimensions that you couldn't produce in three dimensions, right? These uh, impossible figures would be this triangle. If you tried to build this, well, you never could do it because it can exist in two dimensions, but it can exist in three dimensions, okay? It's an impossible figure. Anybody know an artist that uses this concept? Okay, Escher would use it, um, like in something like, well, here if you had a kid try and build Legos like this, <laughs> you would never be able to do it, because you're always going down, 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 and it keeps going down, right? It's an impossible figure in three dimensions. Here's an Escher painting. This painting shows water flowing this way. If you look at the middle screen, water's going down this way, over this wheel, water wheel, and then, of course, the water now is traveling, and it's basically traveling uphill back to here, which is what Escher was doing was taking advantage of this, what we call perceptual conflict, an impossible figure. Then in two dimensions, you could render this like this. It couldn't be built in three dimensions, okay? All right, so in the area of perception, you can start to see, I like how many feet does this elephant have? And it's like, whoa, there's a bunch. <laughs> or, or what we call contrast effects. This is where that movement comes in. So you can see the black dots on this. If you stare at it long enough, the black dots begin to flash up. And these are just simply ways in which your eyes look at. Now this one may be one of my favorites. Here's what it does. 
this square, square A, and square B, marked with a B, look like on a checkerboard, we would say, well, that's a black square, black square, black square, and these, including this B, are all white squares. But in reality, A and B are the exact same color. A, this square, is the same color as that square. How many do not believe that A and B and I'm, ha, are the same color? They are exactly the same color. If you stare at A, this just not the A, the, not the letter color itself, but this square right here is the same color as this square. And to me, it's one, yeah, to me, it's one of the most amazing um, oh, illusion. You want to see it? Ready? Watch. Take a little image, move A up to here. See how A is the same now as this, B is the same right here, and we'll just extend this out. A, still moving out, same color. I just, I just photoshopped and took a picture and kept laying it right next to each other. B, you can see B is the same, and when you bring them out together, <laughs> they show up as exactly the same. Very powerful. <laughs> if you wanna go back and look at it again, Anybody want to know why it looks so different? Why does it look so different? Yeah, there's a couple of features in this. The shadow tells our eye that while this might be darker now, it's because of this shadow of this object. The context, we know that around this, these have different contexts. This is in a brighter light, it appears. This is shadowed. And so when you bring it out, you want to see it one more time? Bring it out. And they're the exact same. It still is one of the most cool illusions out there. OK. What contrasts and these kinds of effects do is they illustrate something. And that is what we will call this relational uh, nature of perception. This illustrates that a lot of what we perceive is based upon context. Context plays a huge role in what we perceive. If we are told somebody is really friendly and outgoing and they just make you feel good, well, as soon as you interact with this person, you're liable in that kind of what we call this context to have a view that they're this way. Uh, another example, and it might influence our perceptions of them. Another example would be in this effect, we can try like um, height. Let me give you an example. Um, if you watch a basketball game on TV, let's say, and you see guys that are obviously smaller than the tallest players, they seem fairly short. I was at, well, I remember watching a, a game, it was a Laker game, watching this player who seems to me, compared to all the other ones, very short, went to a Laker game, got seats not far from the floor, and then at, right at the halftime break, this person walked not far from us, and I remember thinking on TV, he was extremely short compared to all the other players. But when I saw him in real life, he was huge. And I good night, this guy's big. But compared to all these other ones, he looks short, right? That's this idea of how relational it is that our apparent perceptions of things depend upon the surrounding stimuli. That makes sense? So someone might be short to you and seem short, but around a bunch of other short people, they may not seem quite as short. All this says that this and these stimuli all depend upon this context. That's the checkerboard illusion, for example. The blue, uh, I'm sorry, the, the B, the letter B on there, that particular checkerboard looked like it was in a shadow, and so we thought, ah, it's a little bit, you know, that's what accounts for it. And so it's this relational side to it, uh, and its luminance is influenced by those things in its context. All right. Motion perception is one more of these organizing principles that is very interesting, and you could see in this case what's called a, spin, a spinning chevron. Keep your eyes moving when you look at the image, and if you use your peripheral vision as you read this, you can see how many can see the motion. It just appears to be turning as you just maybe read this image up here. That's another one like this, same thing. See the movement of it. And then this one, it's a little bit bigger than it was on the clickers, and then usually you can see it moving more, <laughs> okay? These will be 
pretty cool screensavers at some time, except your eyes would get always p perceiving this motion. So that's the idea of motion perception. I right, questions on anything so far. We're just looking at ways in which we organize and divide up reality. And some of these principles, gestalt and figure ground and grouping, depth perception, perceptual constancies and conflicts, all influence what we perceive. But they're all done in a very fast, almost unconscious level. That is, we're just not even aware of some of these. OK, another big question that we reach in the field is this one. Is there evidence that we can learn to perceive? Is there evidence that we are interpreting things based upon what we have picked up in our environments? And clearly, the answer seems to be that we are able to interpret things based upon that which we've experienced. You might have even played some of these games before, but let's try some. One is called perceptual adaptation. Um, Perceptual adaptation comes in when a person is able to adjust given limited perceptions. Let me try and play a video clip for us real quick. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, then we'll just move forward. All right. So we put it on dock, center, and let's try it. Okay, looks like it's not going to play. Too bad. I'll show it to you next time. Yeah, I know, too bad. It's a cool little video clip, too. In fact, what it does is this. It's a video clip of glasses that displace the visual world by a number of degrees. Has anybody ever seen or worn these glasses where if you put them on, that it would displace the world by a couple of degrees this way. So if you were to reach out and shake his hand, if you put these glasses on, put your hand up and I'll give you five, you, first time you'd go like that and miss. <laughs> and then because the visual world would be moved over here and eventually you'd go like that. Anybody see these? Well, it, people wear them around for a few days or even just for a few minutes and they begin to adjust things. But what's interesting is if I went like this and I wore these glasses, tried to give him five up here and I missed, then eventually I'd start to work this way and work it out so that now I'm adjusting or what we call adapting to this new perceptual reality. But when the person takes off the glasses like this, put their hand up, they miss, now I take the glasses off, what do I do now? You miss which way? The other way, just like that. Now the glasses are off and eventually you come back, okay? So that's an example. We, there are even glasses, and that's a video clip I have, is a person who can wear these glasses that invert the world completely upside down. And uh, I'll show you that one in just a minute. Perceptual adaptation is something that can be done even in changing something as important as turning our visual world upside down. People can get used to wearing these things and adapt. Um, I saw recently, if you go on to a YouTube site, you can click in inverted vision or upside down seeing, and they had a person live in a mall right in the middle of in England, and they lived in this section of the mall in a glass house, basically, wearing upside down glasses, and what their experience was like and how she, it took her a little while to get adjusted. I'll show you that video clip in just a minute, um, if we ever get this fixed. If not, we'll do it on Wednesday. Perceptual sets are another example of ways in which we can point to evidence that perception can be learned. That is, you perceive based upon some what we call perceptual sets. You perceive the world based upon some of these. Some of you might have played this game before. Um, these are what we call mental predispositions. You have perceptual sets or predispositions that influence what you expect to see. Can anybody think of an example of a predisposition that you might have that might influence that which you see in the future? If you're walking down the street, yeah, what's an example? Yeah, if, if what kind of, uh, say it one more time. Yeah, there might be examples, especially in highly stressful environments, like a soldier who might interpret one thing or a police officer differently than somebody else, right? A perceptual set. Uh, a mental predisposition. Give me another example. Anybody? 
Yeah, here's one. It has this. Um, we tend to see most likely when we have images upside down, we focus on the eyes and ears. Now, you know something is a little bit odd here. This is my wife. Um, and uh, you might say, well, it seems a little bit weird. You know it is, but when you turn it up this way, you can see uh, how strange it is. <laughs> so, but upside down, you think, well, it's not that bad. And see, what we tend to do is, again, we tend to focus on the eyes and the mouth. I saw it. I saw it. Yeah. She doesn't know that I've done this, so if, if, if you don't mind uh, not sharing this with her. But again, these are what we call perceptual sets. They can come into play and influence. Let's try this one. Uh, role expectations would be like this. Uh, let me give you an example of a role expectation. Um, if you know the answer, I do this with uh, my little seven-year-old and I tell her, okay, you can't yell it out, ready? So if you know the answer, don't yell it out. So let's try, I did this one with her yesterday and she, she fell to, for this one, ready? Out loud, again, if you know it, don't yell it out. How do you spell cop? Out loud, cop. How do you spell hop? You have to do it louder. How do you spell mop? How do you spell top? What do you do at a green light? Yeah, some of you. It's a little fun game. <laughs> okay. I asked, what do you do at a green light? And how many of you all said you stop at a green light? Yeah, well, there you go. All right, bad drivers. Ready? There's another one. What's this, what's this spell out loud? Ready? What's that spell? One more time. Uh, what do we call the white of an egg? Yeah. It's almost as if... It's, okay, it's the white of an egg. If you said yolk, we don't call the white of an egg yolk. It's this perceptual set that kind of comes into play. You want to try one more? All right, one more. Ready? These are fun to do with young kids and college students up here. What number? Ready? What number comes after 32? What comes after 74? What number comes after 123? What comes after 517? What comes after 1,099? Yeah, many of you said 2,000. You don't even know why you're wrong. 1,099 comes after is 1,100. You all said 2,000. All right, how many said 2,000, by the way? Let me just get a show of <laughs> At least half of you. Okay. These are all what we call role expectations. They're fun little things. And all it does is that you're just set up. You're having a certain mental predisposition, expecting something to come down that your just brain quickly goes to the answer. And by the way, this is that trade-off between speed and accuracy. Quickly, you just say 2,000 when the answer might be that. Now, role expectations have other ways that come into play. I'll let you look at the textbook at some of those. Um, they have a variety of uh, influencers. Uh, that is, situations, contexts, um, all of these uh, different ways or expectations or predispositions that influence ultimately what we perceive. Now, questions on, on some of the basics related to perception. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah, he asked a question about the, uh, from the beginning of class with the person who, who has um, drew the image of the bus. As they asked him this question, for him, what he says is when he's drawing this out, that, even though he left the front end, what he says is that appears to him to be a complete bus. He doesn't see it as incomplete. When he sees a full bus, I don't think it's as if it's not there for him, it just doesn't strike him. And it's just an odd thing because it doesn't happen all of the time. And it's hard, so they asked him, do you not see this part there? And what he says is, that just looks complete to him. So, it, it, it's one of these odd things, we may not ever figure it out. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think he would, he would not notice if you took two pictures side by side, one that did and one that didn't, he would call them identical. Probably not know any difference. It's a weird thing. By the way, when it comes to perceptions, the speed, as I mentioned before, the speed at which we do these things is very quick um, and extremely complex, it uses a variety of circuits that we went over when ultimately we get to that point of recognizing some person, some object, something. Um, part of this, by the way, is accomplished by these things that I talked about in here. Um, one very powerful role also in our perceptions and our feelings about what somebody else might even be perceiving is what I talked about in here called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons, do you remember the idea from the very beginning of class when we talked about something in your brain goes off if somebody was to wave or smile at you? We have these nerve cells that allow us to kind of understand this perception of this other person. That is what they might be experiencing in their brains. And I don't know if I ever described the experiment this way or not. Um, uh, did I talk about when they took this monkey and mapped out its brain and they found one nerve cell that fired? Anybody remember this? This particular monkey, what they did, and it was a, a researcher in Italy and he was exploring different nerve cells and that would fire when a monkey had a perception of something. And in this case, they found a nerve cell that only when this monkey moved, ready? They opened this monkey's brain and this monkey's nerve cell, when it would move its hand like this, I tell you this example, the monkey would go like this. It would, they found, they attached these small microphone uh, electrodes to this, to this monkey's brain. And this person found, for example, a very strange thing, or at least it wasn't strange when he started, but it was this. Every time this monkey would move its arm like this, this particular nerve cell would fire, like that. And it was one nerve cell, and they identified right where it was. But the weird thing about it was that's the only time it ever fired. The monkey could do almost anything else, but until it went like this, this nerve cell wouldn't fire, okay? So the monkey would be sitting there, it would go, the monkey would move its arm up, and this nerve cell in this one spot would go and fire. So now this monkey is sitting there with its arms down just like this, and a lab assistant walks in. And the lab assistant walks into the room carrying an ice cream cone. And the lab assistant goes like this, right in front of the monkey, takes the ice cream cone and goes, and licks, like that, and that nerve cell fires in the monkey. <laughs> the monkey never moves his arm. And so all of a sudden now the person goes, oh, what just happened? That monkey's, the nerve cell, he had, that it fired right then without the monkey moving its arm. Well, that was what we called for the beginning, for this particular uh, researcher, la they eventually labeled these mirror neurons, these nerve cells that normally fire only in response to a particular movement, oftentimes fire when they get a perception of something. So when this lab assistant went like this with the ice cream cone, that monkey almost experienced that same perception. Does that make sense? It ex that nerve cell fired as if it was bringing its hand up there. You ever seen, like I do this sometimes when our children were little, I actually videotape my wife because she would go like this. <laughs> what do mo some moms or dads do when they feed their babies? They take some food like this and they put it in, what, what oftentimes will they do? They'll go, <laughs> just like that, right? They're almost, it's almost like a mirror neuron that fires in response to the perception that they're getting of this baby and they're going, do this, like that. Okay? So I even filmed Elisa doing that because she claimed she didn't do it. It was just done. And so she sees herself, of course, now and isn't real happy with me. Uh, <laughs> but I said, but Elise, watch. You, every time you go, like that. Some of these mirror neurons then have a role of helping us understand the internal world of somebody else. Get it? Sometimes, then, these mirror neurons, which are found throughout the brain, they, by the way, went out and mapped, and they're now located in lots of different places, but they have a role in perception. I am now able, in some respects, to understand your world, your, what you're experiencing, because I now, in a sense, that's firing in mine. So have you ever done this when somebody, have you ever watched ice skaters on TV? Like when they're, when they're kind of going like that, and you kind of start to w w move with them? <laughs> 
these are like oscillators. They're mirror neurons where you're like kind of almost doing that same thing with them. This process then allows us some way to go into the world of somebody else. Now, why do I tell you these stories? Is it possible that sometimes we experience the world of somebody else because of some of these mirror neurons? And the answer is we seem to be able to understand at least intentions in other people or things or at least feel that which they are feeling. Now, it's very different from what we're going to call perception without sensation because what we're doing is we're, some of these nerve cells are firing in response to seeing something clearly out there, even though they're, we're not aware of it. That person that waves all the time and I'm driving by and they smile at me and they don't know me, they're just a crossing guard helping children across, but every morning they kind of wave and I drive by them and I told you, and I go, oh, hi, and I don't want to. But it's as if I experienced that because of this almost mirror neuron going, okay, hi, I wave to you. <laughs> we begin then in as asking this question, is it possible for this to occur even without that visual input? Could a person think a thought and send it to you? And that's what perception without sensation is. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, is that the same thing people do when they're like playing a video game and they're like trying to lean and controller? Yeah, if you see, she said, if you watch people sometimes with video games leaning with that controller, <laughs> and uh, hopefully their body movement would get that thing over that way. Um, that's exactly what this is. Those are oscillators, ways in which we move or pattern our bodies in hopes of this. Okay. Differently is this thing that we're going to call extrasensory perception. Those, by the way, are very clearly found experiences that our brains fire in response to stimuli that are out there. This is saying what is above and beyond our senses called extrasensory or ESP. That's where the word comes from. Perceptions that are beyond or what we call extrasensory. Anybody know somebody in here that has ever showed evidence or heard about examples of ESP? And what have you heard, what, what, how did they, sh what did they show? Anybody? What did, what did you see them do? What, what, what was their, their supposedly ability in, with ESP? Anybody seen it? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, so, the, so he had to maybe guess a number. Let's try it this way. I don't know if he did it this way, but I'll, I'll, there are different categories, by the way, of ESP. Let me just list the three general categories so you know what I'm talking about. One is this idea of telepathy. That is, a person can communicate from one mind to another without using the normal sensory uh, inputs that we all have, and the idea is that somebody that uses telepathy can just communicate, let's say, from one mind to another, not with the senses, not even with these mirror neurons, but just simply in sending a thought. And that's what we call direct communication from one mind to another, or telepathy. Okay? Another example, something called clairvoyance, in which there's this perception of a remote or a distant event. Somebody who doesn't necessarily even have to be in this room, according to a clairvoyant, they can see into a room or see into a distant location. By the way, the military has spent lots of money trying to figure out, is this true a true gift? Do people really have the ability to see into a room that they're not physically in? Anybody heard of somebody with either of these two gifts? The ability to send a message or communicate or a clairvoyant? Or how about precognition, the knowledge of future events? Okay. Yes, question. Yeah, is there, she asked the questions that, uh, that twins might seem to have this ability of something like telepathy communicating. Are, we do have some identical twins in here. Where are the identical twins? Are there, have you have any examples, uh, there's three of you all, four of you, any examples in which you've done this with a twin? Do you have one? Like, like say telepathy, that you've thought something that your sister was either doing or thinking and kind of knew ahead of time.
Yeah. She's saying that her and her sister oftentimes will start conversations, neither one of them are going to say what it is, and it's just you're both aware of this conversation. I have twin brothers, I told you, and one time we're sitting there like this in a house, my house, our house, and one of them is in front of us, and I have, there's a total of five of us boys, uh, at, and uh, one of them, a uh, brother and I were sitting there, and this twin was sitting there, and he went like this, he, um, he started complaining about his leg. And he says this, he was just sitting there doing nothing. And he goes, oh, man, my knee, my leg hurts. And, and it would have not been anything. It wouldn't even register. It wouldn't even remember it other than the fact of what happened next. Because I remember we were kind of thinking, yeah, we didn't even kick you yet, you know, today. <laughs> and your knee's hurting. So he's just sitting there, oh, my knee hurts. That was probably, I don't know, three o'clock in the afternoon. About an hour and a half later, my mom comes home with his identical twin brother. They just got back from the hospital. He had been in a bike accident and his right knee was hurt. And we asked, what, what were you doing? Oh, I was over at my friend Johnny's and I fell and did this or that. What time? It was like three o'clock and me and my other brother went, oh. <laughs> oh my gosh, they have this thing going between them. One of them hurt his knee and the other one did it, yeah, or felt it. Go ahead. Yeah, he asked, he asked about something called deja vu. Did, did you ask me that question before? Because it feels like... Okay, it's just one of those weird moments. I'll tell you what I'll do. We're out of time, but here's what we'll do. We don't have time to do the tricks, apparently, with ESP, but wait one second. On Wednesday, I'll go ahead and show the video clip that I promised with upside down vision. We'll finish looking at ESP real quickly, and then we'll talk about states of consciousness, at which point we may or may not talk about deja vu. We certainly will when it comes to the topic of memory. Okay, we'll see you on Wednesday. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at viola.edu.